We're going to focus on fire. Um, ICLR has uh, partnered with uh, Professor Scothorn and produced relatively recently uh, reports about um, Montreal and Vancouver and what would be the potential impact of a fire following a large earthquake. Uh, Charlie's put together a session today with Arash, Tom and Bryant to talk further about um, uh, why it's important to think about fire following large earthquakes. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Charlie for this session. Charlie, are you there? I saw you. I've been online with Charlie already, but I'm not hearing him talking. Charlie, you're on mute if you're speaking to us right now. Okay, a big pause here. Not always the best when we're doing these sorts of things. Uh, I'm going to go off stop share, stop share just for a moment. And then hopefully I'll get us back going. Uh, I do not see Charlie. There you are, Charlie. Okay. There you are. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. And um, okay, fine. Um, thank you very much, Paul. Sorry about that glitch. And uh, can you go to the next slide? Can you hear me? There, there you go. You um, thanks very much. So uh, the outline for our session is uh, I will give a, a brief int introduction of the speakers and then uh, delve into fire following earthquake a little bit with focus on lower mainland. And then AIR, CoreLogic and RMS will discuss their models and hopefully we'll have time for Q&A. So if we can go to the next slide, please. No, there you go. The speakers, uh, you've already uh, heard uh, from Arash and Bryant uh, from AIR and RMS, respectively. And uh, Core Logic in this session will be represented by Tom Larson. Um, so, three good looking guys and the moderator. Um, and I, I won't uh, go into our backgrounds at all. Next slide, please. Okay, so Van Vancouver is um, in the upper is shown in the upper right, and uh, it is a uh, under threat as we've seen from earthquake, but also as any major city, just, such as shown in the lower left and lower right, um, you can have major fires under ordinary conditions. Um, the uh, <clears throat> uh, lower right is a large fire we had in San Francisco last year, and lower left is a high, major high rise fire uh, sustained a few years ago. Um, the uh, but also, and less appreciated, is the fact that we can have major fires after earthquakes, such as shown in the center bottom in 1906 in San Francisco, but in more modern times in the upper center in 1989 in San Francisco, and in the upper right in Tokyo in 2011. As a matter of fact, the Tohoku earthquake in Japan had uh, as many fires in that one event as had occurred in uh, previous earthquakes in the 20th century. Next slide. Thank you. To address this, uh, as Paul mentioned, uh, the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction sponsored two studies. One, uh, and the reports are shown on the left here, uh, the upper one for Montreal and the lower one for the ma lower mainland. And these are available on ICLR's website. The study area for the lower mainland study is shown in the upper right, and it included 10 communities, uh, uh, all the urbanized areas and the population densities can be appreciated from the road network, which is shown in the lower right. Next slide, please. Time doesn't permit me to go into the full explanation of everything that was done. I refer you to the reports. The analysis followed a typical engineering flow chart with uh, five scenarios, which were shown on the upper right. Uh, I'll be discussing those scenarios a bit later. The ground, the building data, uh, was building specific and took into account special conditions such as the uh, overhead uh, trans uh, distribu electric distribution in uh, Vancouver. We took into account the fire apparatus, which has just been covered over there, and the water. We took into account the actual water supply networks, uh, 
uh, including, uh, shown in the lower left here, the dedicated fire protection system, which is almost unique to Vancouver. It's only one of two such systems in the world, the other being in San Francisco. Uh, involving all the water supply and uh, uh, proximity to uh, uh, Burrard Inlet and other water supply areas, as well as the dedicated fire protection system, the analysis took into account water supply factors, which varied across the region and which are shown in the lower right. And those that water supply factor, as well as ignitions and other factors, um, was uh, based on spatial correlation in the ground motions, which I don't think has been mentioned in any of the previous presentations. Next slide, please. Charlie, while I'm advancing the slides, um, that last one, it advanced, uh, it added elements on its own, just so you would know what that means. I just, okay. just so, so you know what. Slides, actually, all you need to do is advance when I ask. Thanks. Okay, will do. Thanks. Okay, because I put in animation. So jumping to the bottom line, uh, these, um, this slide shows the ground motions for one of the scenarios we looked at. It was a magnitude 7.3 in the Georgia Strait, quite close to Vancouver. And the median ground motions are shown on the upper left. And those uh, can then be related to the pattern of ignitions, which is shown in the upper right. Um, and the, there's variation, the, there was a, a median, of course, number of ignitions, but Monte Carlo simulation was used in all these studies. So there was a distribution on the actual number of ignitions and that distribution is shown on the lower left. And convolving that with fire spread and fire department response and other factors, which again, time doesn't permit me to go into, we get a distribution of losses and the mean loss distribution is shown in the lower right. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> this shows actually the scenario results for the five scenarios that we looked at. Um, the <clears throat> three of those scenarios are shown in the map on the lower right. Um, the going across the table, the first scenario, which was a magnitude nine Cascadia subduction zone, was far to the west and is off the map. But as you can see, it resulted in relatively few ignitions, about 16 on average. And the, the median loss was relatively modest, about $160 million uh, overall. $160 million is a lot of money. But compared to the other scenarios, it's frankly, and even for the insurance industry, it's a relatively neg negligible cat loss. Uh, scenario two was a magnitude 6.8 on the Juan de Fuca Strait. Um, the arrow shows where the epicenter was located, relatively close to the lower mainland area. And it generated on average about 100 ignitions and <clears throat> led to an overall estimated loss of about 7 billion Canadian dollars. Significant. Um, third scenario was 7.3 uh, in the Leech River on Vancouver Island, negligible losses. Scenario four was a magnitude 7.3 in the Georgia Strait. I just showed in the previous slide the ground motions for that. Uh, you can see where the epicenter was. And on average, that generated the largest losses, about 10, almost $11 billion. And uh, then we more or less wanted to look at a direct hit, so to speak. So we put a, arbitrarily put a magnitude 6.5 in New Westminster, uh, which is within the lower mainland area. That generated about 100 ignitions and losses of about $7 billion. I should mention that the, uh, the first scenario, EQ1, EQ2, 3, and 4, uh, were the same scenarios that are being used uh, in some of the studies by NRCAM, and that's why they were selected. Uh, but the ground motions were generated by us. We did not use the NRCAN ground, ground motions and our ground motions were spatially correlated to take into account that, which is very important when modeling fire following earthquake. The last point I wanna mention is these losses are quite large. And as opposed to earthquake losses, the, from an insurance perspective, these losses are almost entirely insured. So in fact, these losses uh, proportionally have a much greater impact on the insurance industry than shaking losses might have. Uh, and this is a great concern to the insurance industry. Swiss Re, for example, in 2017 pointed out that this has the potential for a domino type of financial contagion within the Canadian financial industry, not just insurance, but going into banking. And this aspect is being addressed by the industry and government. Next slide, please. So not only did we look at what the risk might be, but we also 
want to reduce that risk. So we made recommendations, both in Montreal and for Vancouver, and I'll talk about the Vancouver recommendations here. And those recommendations, uh, there were several of them. I'll talk about three key recommendations we made. The first recommendation, which is the upper figure and the text, was to create a regional, regional portable water supply system. Um, and this is something that actually the city of Vancouver is already well on the way to doing. Uh, is, it has recently acquired some special apparatus for deploying large diameter hose um, and has fire boats and some other specialized equipment. But the other fire departments in the area, North Van, um, uh, City of Fraser and so on, Burnaby, do not have the same kind of equipment and are not able to coordinate with Vancouver. So we are working with those fire departments to get them to develop this system. The second uh, major recommendation we made had to do with high rise buildings. As uh, uh, high rise fires are particularly challenging as everyone appreciates, the fire on the left is the first interstate bank building fire in 1991 in Los Angeles. It was the tallest high rise fire in Western North, excuse me, it was the tallest high rise building in Northern, Northern, in Western North America at the time. Um, and it was a total burnout of four stories with smoke damage for all stories above and water damage for all stories for below, a massive loss. And this required the resources of about half the Los Angeles City Fire Department to fight. Now, Los Angeles City Fire Department is the largest fire department in Western North America, and they were challenged by this one building. Um, after an earthquake, especially in a place like Vancouver, where there are hundreds of high-rise buildings, there's going to be more than one of these kinds of fires. As a result of that, the building code in the United States requires in high seismicity areas that high-rise buildings have a secondary water supply. That is, high-rise buildings typically these days are sprinkled. They are sprinklers. But those sprinklers are served by the water mains in the streets. And after an earthquake, those water mains are going to fail. So there's not going to be any water for those sprinklers. In recognition of that, the building codes in the United States, like California, have required a secondary water supply for over 50 years now. And that water supply is typically like a, a 15,000 gallon or 60,000 liter tank of water in the basement next to the fire pumps. Surprisingly, the National Building Code of Canada, BC bylaws, and the city of Vancouver do not have this requirement. We are working with uh, EGBC, Engineers and Geoscientists of British Columbia, to get this put into the building code going forward. Uh, so that was our second recommendation. Third recommendation to reduce fire following losses had to do with gas meters and the gas system. Um, there is no requirement in BC for gas shut off, seismic shutoff devices associated with gas systems. The gas uh, provider in the BC area, the Fortis company, are about to replace all of their gas meters. And we have recommended to them and are trying to work with them to get them to include a seismic gas shutoff device within their meters um, when they replace their meters, just as has been done in Japan, for example. So these are some of the forces for good, so to speak, that ICLR is trying to promote in Western Canada to reduce the fire falling earthquake problem. Next slide. Now, Canada's insurers rely on the, the modelers we've just been hearing from, AIR, CoreLogic RMS, and of course the NRCAN model to model earthquake losses in general and fire falling earthquake. How good are the fire falling earthquake models? We can examine the quality of the models and think of it in terms of a triangle of knowledge. In other words, um, is the, uh, are the models uh, broad-based and relatively simple, such as shown at the bottom of the triangle, uh, where they just have a, a very simplistic uh, characterization of the buildings and the fire resistant, resistiveness? Or are they sort of intermediate level of detail where there's more, more building types and some modeling of fire spread and so on? Or at the top, are they highly detailed models with individual building properties, taking into account the building spacing, 
the fire spread equations, analytics of water supply networks, and so on. And uh, as you go up this triangle, the cost of the models increases, but you get what you pay for. So the accuracy increases. So we've asked CoreLogic, AIR, and RMS to comment on the quality of their models in this sort of a framework. And some of the aspects such as hazard, building inventory, uh, we've asked them not to, not to comment on because they've already discussed that already and those are relatively easy. The things that are more difficult are the ignition models, how they characterize the water resources, did they do modeling of the water networks? Did they take into account the dedicated fire protection system, which is unique in Vancouver? How do they model the fire service response and the fire spread? And even to give us some example results. Now, having asked them to do that, I thought it was not only fair to also try and characterize the modeling we did in uh, for Montreal and Vancouver in the same framework. So next slide, Paul. <clears throat> in doing that modeling, we did field surveys. We had meetings with the fire departments, the water departments, the building departments, and other agencies. And of course, we engaged in the usual GIS data type collection. The ignition models were empirical based on each building's attributes, taking into account the size of the building, the occupancy, and uh, in, in the Monte Carlo simulations, random time of day and season. The water characterization of the water supply took into account the serviceability of each segment of each distribution pipe. We had full models for all the pipe. Actually, NRCAN helped us with that data collection. We took into account the size of the pipe, the materials, the age of the pipe, the type of soil it's in, and so on. <clears throat> we met with the fire departments. We took into account all of their fire apparatus, their engines. Um, we tracked each engine as they, as they move around fighting the fires and so on, uh, and whether they had water or not. And we took into account the fire spread. Now, this is not to, so I would say overall that the modeling that we did would fall in the upper detailed level of characterization of a, of a model. It's not to say the, model, the models that were used for the ICLR studies were perfect. It could always be improved. Uh, we could have better modeling of the ignitions, uh, we could be doing actual hydraulic analysis of the water networks, which are doing, which we are doing in San Francisco, but we didn't do it in the Lower Mainland. <clears throat> we we uh, made certain assumptions, and we could be improving it through artificial intelligence decision-making models, which is an area for future research, and so on. So this is a characterization of this model. And again, we've asked, and then the next slide, <clears throat> we'll ask them to go. Next slide, thank you. AIR first with um, Aresh to characterize his model, and then CoreLogic and RMS. And Aresh, over to you, and you probably are tired of looking at yourself, so next slide. <laughs> sure, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Yardi. Uh, yeah, I want to start by saying that we have recognized the importance of fire following from the very first models that uh, they produced for earthquake. And through the years, uh, we have made change the model significantly, and you know, in the evolution and progression of the model, uh, the work and publication by Dr. Scotton has been really a key reference. Now, uh, I brought this slide again up here um, just to remind everyone that the way that we model is that we generate events and go through this whole process. But fire following for us is a model within a model. So for each of those events that we simulate, we go into a very detailed and sophisticated modeling. And I'm, in the interest of time, I'm just going to touch on a few of them. So basically, I think from the triangle that uh, Dr. Scotton was uh, talking about, we started from the bottom and we moved our way up to the top of that. Next slide, please. Thanks. Oh, okay. I think it doesn't show all the uh, stuff that I had here, but that's fine. Um, so basically, this is the general framework of our fire following model. Uh, obviously, it starts from the ground motion simulation. What you are not seeing there is the ignition model. Uh, and we have the probabilistic fire spread, dynamic fire suppression, and then the loss estimation. Now, one thing that we need to pay attention, we need to remember is that as we spoke in the previous sessions, we, meant, we say that earthquake models are uncertain. When we think about the components that go into the fire, as you heard from Dr. Scotton, it's really make fire following even more uncertain. So the key for a model is to be able to capture all, all the uncertainties, bring in all the information and input data that is needed, and through this process, we also need to do a lot of advanced modeling and components. That includes understanding the exposure, understanding the blocks, and then how the fire spreads. Next slide, please. Uh, 
So as I mentioned, uh, the really first uh, key element or step in understanding and modeling fire following is to first understand what's the, what's the exposure. Because you know, ignition and spread only happens when there is an exposure. And in, in the context of the regional models, um, in our catastrophe model, it's really not possible to go into every individual building. Uh, and as such, our approach is to look at the built environment, identify what are the characteristics that impact fire hazard, and then create, a blo create characteristic blocks that represent different types of uh, building. This basically includes different material type, different heights, and essentially different combustibility level for the buildings. And then size of the building, spacing between the buildings, and density of the block are really the characteristic that we use or features that we use to define our characteristic block. So here you see some example of them, for example, park or open spaces, uh, blocks of primarily single family and so on. Uh, next slide, please. So as we identify and uh, capture the built environment, the next step in the whole process is to do the ignition. And our ignition generation model takes into account um, the ground motion intensity. Uh, that's really the, the main cause of uh, this whole fire following. And on top of that, we need to have information about the fuel or the exposure that is there to, uh, to start the ignition. And we follow again, a lot of um, formulation and equations from uh, Dr. Scotton's work. And uh, we look at the probabilistic, um, uh, uh, probability distribution that takes into account intensity of the ground motion and square uh, or floor area uh, as, as a representation of the so amount of fuel. And in the bottom, you see an example of the validation uh, that we have done, obviously, with events in outside of Canada. But that show, shows how the ignition models work. Uh, next, slide, next slide, please. Uh, and when we talk about the spread, uh, our modeling of the spread is very detailed. We basically look at it from two levels. We have the blocks, and then we have the regions. Our approach to start from the block and then move it up to the levels. For example, in this case, as uh, in the slides, what you're seeing is that for any of the characteristic blocks, we break them down into very detailed three by three meters, three meter cells. And we perform uh, the, uh, a fire analysis in each of the blocks to get something as the burn function, which becomes the, character, uh, the property of that block. And then we move up from block and assign each of this block within a one kilometer grid uh, by looking at the satellite images, land use and land cover data, and a lot of information uh, from public and private sectors. And then as you move to the right, you'll see how this one kilometer grids are then kind of put in the puzzle and represent the entire region. Next slide, please. So on, uh, on modeling the spread of fire within each characteristic block, uh, we use a cellular automata model. This is a very complex physics-based model. Um, that allows us to account for all different variation. So once we have the blocks, we basically run multiple thousands of simulation. Each simulation uh, randomly change the location of the ignition, uh, the uh, wind speed and direction, uh, and of course also a different mechanism that spread can happen. And the outcome of this cellular uh, at automata model will be a burn function, which as you can see here, it shows the size of fire as a function of time. So that's within a block. Now moving from uh, the, the second uh, part of the spread is how can fire spread and jump from one block to another? And that's really what uh, poses the main risk uh, uh, at the end to, to the loss uh, damage from fire. And these are done again, probabilistically using some equations that already exist and takes into account the variation of uh, probability of fire crossing the blocks, depending on wind condition, also suppression, and um, and also takes into account uh, the, the, the width and <clears throat> size of those breaks. Next slide, please. Yeah, and then the next uh, step in the process is the fire suppression. In our model, this is done in a very dynamic way uh, because it all depends of when the ignition happens, uh, what's the time, uh, that's needed for the engine or basically for the suppression force to get into the location of fire. And that requires information about the location of the engine data, location of the fire hydrants data, uh, 
and that's all included in the model. And as Dr. Scott mentioned, uh, looking at the specific uh, at the water that is available in particular cities is very important in Vancouver. We do account for that Vancouver uh, dedicated fire protection system, uh, but we also take into account the possibility of having al alternative water sources. These are like lakes and rivers where in case uh, water can be drawn and used from there. Uh, and one thing that is very, very important in the, uh, in, in the fire suppression is the serviceability. As we are talking about the earthquake or fires after the earthquake, there is always possibility that the pipelines get damaged due to an earthquake. So even if the fire engine and fire fighters are at the site, there may not be any water to use. So that's included into our model by uh, considering the serviceability uh, of, of the pipes and uh, for example, roadblocks and so on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so to close it, uh, considering the time, uh, I also wanted to uh, show some model results. Uh, the scenario that I'm selecting here uh, is the repeat of the 1732 uh, magnitude 5 point earthquake uh, in Montreal. Sorry for the typo of there, it's near Montreal. Uh, and uh, what we know about the event is this event is obviously very rare. It could be considered a tail event. Uh, but its magnitude and location is not exactly known. So what we have done is that we have considered the variation for both magnitude and location. You can see uh, as shown in uh, star with one and two, uh, the one uh, in star as one is a 5.8 kind of south of um, uh, St. Lawrence River. And uh, the second event being right in the downtown uh, Vancouver, uh, Montreal, sorry. And you can see uh, here the average or, or the mean fire following losses that are shown here, uh, 8.9 for uh, first event at 17.8, almost twice of that uh, on the second event. And these are in 2017 values. But one thing I wanted to mention on that is these are the mean losses um, that are coming from uh, 50 different simulation. So there could be losses in that simulation that are higher and the lower. And the importance really here is the fact that there is a lot of uncertainty in this losses and it's very, very important to, to capture that amount of uncertainty in the model. So with that, I'll, thanks a lot, and I'll uh, pass it to the next presenter. All right, can you hear me? Um, thanks a lot for that, uh, Raj. I think we can probably go to the next slide. You've, that's a big enough picture of me. Um, you know, so we were asked to talk about earthquake fire falling risk modeling for um, Canada. I think it's important to talk about what is not in the model, is that when an earthquake occurs, there are, a lot, there are many fires, um, but we can think of a couple, 1964 Niigata earthquake, where the um, refinery, the fuel tanks burned for several, um, several days. And uh, 1999 is mid Turkey, uh, were big notable refinery fires, earthquake refinery fires. Now they're in a special class that we call, um, I think of as, as occupancies that go boom, but they're, um, they're processed facilities. These are um, types of risks that have specialized fire risk. They're always burned. In fact, when we look at all earthquakes, we can go back and see almost could have and smaller fires in these types of facilities. But they also have their own firefighting rules, much higher specific rules, and many of them have their own site fire departments. So, that discussion, the, that type of fire is a very specific type of fire that we talk about with that market niche that ensures that. But what we're talking about today is um, more closely associated with the urban conflagration risk. What happens to the greater, greater populace? So it's both of them are important, but I, what we're talking about here today is this piece. Um, what we've got as a methodology is, yeah, essentially you've got fires get ignited. Um, they're, they are, they spread and they're simultaneously fought. And then we go into the normal, the, the typical parts of the model. It's the damage assessment. Now, this one, it's a special, it's a little bit different because it's a very much a tipping point. And we're gonna, I'm gonna repeat that again, is that fires, they occur every earthquake. Um, every, you know, Charlie talked about these so tremendous number of fires that were done in, in Tahoku, but we could also say that, you know, the thousands of buildings that were burned in, uh, in Kobe, uh, there were dozens of fires, very large fires that only burned a few homes in 1994 Northridge. 
And that's the type of data we have to look broad to be able to understand and anticipate what the risk is in Canada because we can't wait until the next big fire in Canada. Can we go to the next slide? So, you know, to go through Charlie's points here, we want to talk about the earth ignition. Um, and, you know, I wanted to, we, Charlie asked us to talk about it in the concept of his uh, triangle of knowledge. The ignition data that we get is garnered from uh, going through and reviewing earthquakes throughout the world and trying to characterize it, you know, identify where the fire was uh, and try to characterize it so that we can anticipate it. Um, what we're doing, um, the data is low. There aren't that many earthquakes even worldwide. And then trying to associate it with the types of occupancies where we have a modern, you know, uh, uh, you know a modern suburbia and an urban area in, in Vancouver and try to associate it. So one of the key rates we use is we look at ignitions, they are based on humans, human occupancy. So it's, it's a uniform by occupancy by square footage. Um, so, you know, if we look at Charlie's triangle of knowledge, one of the key aspects is that we're not really looking at the end of, in every little room and trying to understand where is that ignition. We know generally where the ignitions are. Um, now, when we do a portfolio analysis, because here now we're as a modeler, we're talking about at first that what Charlie did was the, the big overall study. And I'll get to, we'll talk about some loss numbers there. But when a client puts in their individual portfolio, they have specific occupancy. So we even though that generally that area might be a commercial office, but you have, you're writing a residential building, there we will be accounting for both. Because one of the challenges and a big divergence between far falling earthquake and in uh, seismic damage is that seismic damage is really generally based on how well built is your building. But fire following risk, it's not just what happens inside the walls of your building, it's what happens outdoors too. So you are impacted by that region, regardless if you're in a lower risk occupancy building, you're insuring a low risk building, but you're in a high risk area, you still can burn badly. Um, but we do have very, the ignition rates do vary in these areas by these, uh, these general tenants right here. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so I apologize now for having pictures on every slide. I know it's hard to sit and watch video um, screens all day. Um, but the suppression, it's a key aspect of it. Um, you know, if, let's go through this thing, but I think it's really important to talk about is Firefighters, the most important thing for a firefighter is not to put out that build, that fire. They are there to save lives. They're versus, and gener this is worldwide, is that their life safety is paramount for, uh, and we're talking about a fire, a bunch of ignitions at the same time that there are lots of damage. So, and, you know, we generally associate these uh, ignitions, there's more ignitions, there's more damage. There are other distractions that are of higher priorities. First is to stabilize lives, Get the incident stabilized, and then go to property, you know, property conservation, which is you know, put the fires out. So when we look at this now, um, it is, and this is, it's a very challenging one. Now, the talk about what, what Charlie did versus ours. He wanted to talk about the triangle of knowledge. Okay, the water resources. We can certainly, and we look at is the the reliability of the water supply. We do know the soft soil areas because we're earthquake modelers. We've got ad adequate models. We know where those are. We can characterize where the sources, where the you know where the water the reservoirs are in the area, and we can get a general idea of where are the risky regions. Um, but we don't do a snapshot of that absolute day, which is what what Charlie did. Is that appropriate in a model? Absolutely, because these things change over time. Charlie's snapshot is good for a good time. We're looking at trying to build a model that would be good for several years. Similar to is looking at the fire, man, um, the fire staffing. Um, fire budgets are municipal budgets, and they're stressed everywhere. There are standard guidelines on how many engines, how many, <clears throat> how many, how many crew you need per fire engine, and we're not always doing that everywhere throughout the world. We do the best we can to kind of try to, at the time of release, get a good idea of what are the general uh, patterns in this region, and we can do it um, <clears throat> regionally, and we do it nationwide for these things. Um, this is, it's a very key aspect because there are areas throughout the world that have, you know, because it's not unusual to see the water go, water resources go down to zero and you can't fight the fires. Um, but now it, doing the simulation of these pieces, when we have, we're simulating different patterns of ignitions, you're putting different stresses on different areas. So the fires don't always show up in the same regions. Can we go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> 
Okay, I have to do a, a side here because that picture right there, that's um, 1989 Loma Prieta. At that time, I was working at a company called EQE Engineering for a, a very rigorous boss who made sure that you did diligent work and who may or may not be the moderator of this session. And uh, the earthquake occurred at 5.04 p.m. in, in San Francisco. Um, and uh, he very nicely gave me a ride home. So at 11 p.m. that night, we were at the fire. We were walking the fire lines in this area where the fires were on the way home as part of the field trip. Um, it's, uh, fire has always been part of the, the fabric of an earthquake and we always do this. But it's important on the fire spread. That image was put in there because look at where the smoke is going. It goes, smoke is going straight up in the air. There was no wind. Um, the fire ignition, if we go look at, now we have to start stretching ourselves. What, what is the behavior of big fires? Now we have to look at wildfires. They are a different spread mechanism. It's, um, you know, it's convection versus the, the radiation of close, but it is the fire itself. When we look at the general fire triangle of fire, it's heat, air, and fuel. Air is air, the wind coming in can make a fire much hotter and will really push a fire outwards. The fire in San Francisco was as small as it was because there was no wind that day. Had there been 20 mile an hour winds, we could have gotten significant uh, increase in the losses. So what we've done in the model is we do include simulations on the wind speed, both the direction and, and the severity of the winds. Um, what I've down below on the lower right, that's just a sort of a cartoon characterization. You have different ways to how do you get the wind rose at? What is the wind riskiness for a region? But if we go specifically on Vancouver, if we look at the 90 percentile winds, the one in 10, so it's certainly not a very extreme. In April, the winds are about seven and a half miles an hour. Um, in August, they're about five miles per hour. So it does change seasonally. And that's an important aspect of one of the uncertainties is when does it occur? But it's, this, it's the size of these winds and, you can, um, and it's higher of what could occur. Sorry about that. Um, but the fire spread module on the urban conflagration, again, it's focused on the density of construction is the amount of fuel. We've also gone in and characterized those fuel in inventories, looking at what is burnable. Certainly concrete doesn't burn, but wood does. And do we want to know? And so in these areas, how fast will it spread? Um, what are the occupancies? And it, but it, the weather, weather is really an important part in really trying to understand what's that tipping point where San Francisco had relatively constrained with only a, a few blocks burnt versus did a quarter of San Francisco burn on that day. Can we go to the next slide? So Charlie wanted to ask us to look at fire following for the Vancouver area. Um, so now I, I couldn't replicate his study. What I did was see the shaded area. So we have in this shaded area, I've done a simulation of all of the earthquakes that could go in these areas. So there, I did analysis of thousands of earthquakes in this area with a variety of magnitudes using our probabilistic model to go through and look at the probabilistic outputs. Um, I bend these by magnitude. So I, over on the curve on the right, I take an, a, a magnitude. So that magnitude five bend is the, between 4.75 and five and a quarter. The five and a half is between 5.75. <clears throat> I bounded the, the bar represents, the lower part of that bar is the average. So I you look at these, uh, as I look through these things, I've taken each of these bends has uh, is hundreds of earthquakes within it. I've, they are, <clears throat> and hundreds of outcomes. They are, so you could run the same earthquake. In our model, you would get the same earthquake, but you, you would see a variety of different losses for the same earthquake that are embedded in this stochastic model. So these are outcomes in here. What do I get? So I see for the magnitude five earthquakes, um, not a lot. You know, and uh, oh, the another thing that I did here was I plotted these on a log chart. So it's it's kind of a trick because these look like they're a nice line here, but if I had not done it in the log, you would have seen that they would have gone off scale. But it makes it harder to show into a, a graph like this. But what it does is it reinforces is that the stronger ground motions, it they really are. They get really severe. Um, so we we see here that for a magnitude six earthquake. On average, 
for a magnitude six earthquake. Uh, we see our model would produce about $100 million of losses, but a magnitude six earth, um, earthquake could generate losses up to about $8 billion. Uh, and if we were to reference these to the, the Scothorn paper, um, the, his estimates for these several points are, relative, are generally embraced in these things. Um, so it, it's certainly conceivable from this very, this analysis using our, our market portfolio is the loss potential is up to $20 billion is easily foreseeable. Um, and it, but again, it's, there's a significant uncertainty in that risk. Um, these, you know, these very big bands, that same earthquake that could cost $10 billion could only, could be, you know, a couple billion, or could be 1 billion. So that's a, a very significant range. It's not what we typically see for earthquake shaking, where we see a lot more compression in it. Um, Charlie did uh, have an exhibit on the Cascadia um, earthquake. Um, our answers are above his, but not, not nearly as, as out of line. They're um, only a few, there are a couple scale, a few factors higher than his. I think comparison, comparing to Earth, Charlie's earthquake for the Cascadia, Cascadia is really complex in the types of magnitudes and how you run the different types of ruptures. So I don't know if it's fair. Can we go to the next slide? Um, you know, to, when we reflect on this, and again, it goes back to, you know, the triangle of knowledge that Charlie refers to is how do you make a competent decision? Is how do we use these types of models for decision making? And so, you know, if you reflect on that and you look at, you know, those huge bands that I, I displayed on the magnitudes is should, I think it really does open up the question for risk management. Should we look at fire falling in the same manner as we look for shake damage? Um, the, the bands, the uncertainty is much higher. Um, we typically, we mentioned earlier today, we use the 500 year loss, the 0.2% probability, um, the loss level that has a 0.2% probability of being exceeded every year. It's generally used, it's commonly used throughout the world as a, a very confident level. But we see these losses for fire where the 500 year, they're marginally in the decision-making um, if we look at the 500 year, the true probabilistic number for fire following, it doesn't look that consequential, but we know inside of it, it harbors a, a very large tail. We've talk, been talking about these tail risks is that what goes on out there in the tail beyond that 500 year, what's that 1000 year? And that's where we should be considering different types of statistics it includes the tail value at risk, which is the average of the tail beyond that point. So that's, really important we you know we should consider that is should we be using a t-bar type of analysis to understand the wildfire earthquake risk um and with that charlie tells me that i'm getting the hook thanks a lot all right uh brian you're on yeah thanks so much charlie <laughs> So in the interest of time, actually, I'm going to start off just saying if anyone's interested um, in talking more, so I'm going to have to go a little bit uh, fast through these. Uh, please reach out to me. It's bryant.reyes at rms.com. Um, love to talk more and go into more detail about this stuff. Um, so uh, to start off with the model, so our model is uh, a emergency car. Well, it's, it's really about the creating these, these fire loss indices, which are created through running the model, uh, the fire following model. Um, it's over 24 million simulations for 24 metro area six in, in Canada um, and where we can actually like start to look at the, the correlations between PGA ground motions and everything else that goes into all that all of that that's input to the model. Um, that's what that's what all these simulations really allow, allow us to do. So next slide. Um, we have a really high resolution data set for each one of these 24 uh, metro areas. Uh, given building footprints and heights and really gives us a really good understanding of separation between buildings, city block sizes, et cetera. Um, really important inputs to the model. Um, we have precise locations and counts of fire engines, of course, as we mentioned, next slide. Um, and then we go to the actual ignition model. So the ignition model uh, is a proprietary based model based on seasonality, based on construction and occupancy, as we've all discussed uh, throughout, the, throughout these, these uh, talks. Uh, super important that you know it's not the same uh, amount of emission that happens in different seasons, uh, not just given uh, given for 
depending on the actual occupancy of, of the of the exposure, the actual construction class, but also the the seasonality, uh, how the wind, what the wind looks like, uh, what happens with humidity, things like that. Next slide. Uh, so that's wind direction and humidity again for every one of the grid cells in our model. So it's twenty four metro areas, really huge data set. Um, we have a stochastic, we, not stochastic, excuse me. We have a multicolor based uh, simulation set that take, it takes um, randomly and gives you really good correlations at the end so we can understand what, which parameters are more important than others. And we, we know that PGA is probably the, the main driver of, of risk in all earthquake risk, but especially even in, in fire following. Uh, next slide, please. So once you, you have all this input data, you have uh, your ignition model. Um, how does the fire actually spread um, and how is that fire suppressed? So we use a combination of recalibrated uh, models that are used in the literature. We recalibrate them for each one of the cities so that we can understand, uh, so we can get very specific values for each city. Um, we have dynamic approach to, to the fire suppression. So fire engines are, um, are they, they, they are dispatched in different ways depending on the, the value of PGA and depending on how big of an impact it is, as Tom said. Uh, often firefighters are off, you know, trying to save lives, not necessarily suppressing the fire. Um, we take all that into account. We take into account also uh, road networks being being uh, destroyed or or uh, uh, water water systems being spread. All kind of inherently within that PGA value of of this model. Um, next, please. Uh, what I wanted to want to focus on and want to get to to this in the example is that we put a big, big emphasis on validation of these models. So as we've all said, data is, is very, very scarce. But the data that we do have, we do try to use that um, as much as we can. And we've published uh, some papers on, on the validation of our prior following model. Um, the first figure here on the top left is just showing, so two models are the, the gray line is the Hassis 2009 model, a, a fairly widely used um, our ignition model. And the red is our, is our model. Um, you can see how well they fit. These are two different approaches, but we're getting relatively good, uh, good um, agreement between the two, which is always a good thing to see in sort of the modeling world. Anytime you model anything, you'd, you want to get a, some kind of spread, but you want to make sure that we're in the same ballpark. And so in terms of ignitions, we're really getting those values. And then looking at the table on the right, um, one of the issues that we have here is that we're looking at fires that happened or earthquakes that happened 100 years ago um, and the amount that was ignited then versus now, uh, given you have to update the actual exposure and try to recreate that earthquake if it were to happen today. Um, and we've, uh, we've, there's some literature out there that says that there's, for instance, there's 1906 event, there would have been 500, earth, uh, 500 ignitions. We have our model shows a mean of about 720 um, going down to 570 to 898 um, in that range. So Again, we're fairly happy with this with this uh, validation, and you can see the rest of the validations as well. Um, things like the Northridge event, which is a relatively recent event, um, we're doing really, really well. I'm very happy with it. Um, and this is what allows us to really expand this. So we use these high, really uh, uh, highly high resolution simulations in every one of these metro areas, and then we can use that fire loss index to to in a statistical way to really expand the geography of that, so we can get. To uh, to cover all of, all of the continent and all the all of Canada as well. Uh, next slide. So just wanted to show uh, one example. So this is a Montreal six point five event in in the middle of the city um, uh, using RMS industry exposure databases. This is just a ground up loss cost map. Um, what you would expect it you know follows the PGA. Um, and then the next slide here is showing the percentage of fire following to total loss. Um, so here you're going from, you know, almost around, you know, some areas don't really experience any fire following after this event. And some areas experience 7% of the loss, up to 7% of the loss is, uh, is from that fire. Um, and so we can see how, you know, the, it's very, very uncorrelated. It's, 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 uh, you can see how there's variation in the fire following loss. And all this comes about from whether there's fire stations nearby, uh, what the occupancy is like in those, in those areas, what the exposure is like, what the water systems are like. Um, and all that can be taken into account. And you can diversify your portfolio through that. You can also identify the, the exposures in your portfolio that might be at more risk uh, to fire following using these kinds of maps. So 
Um, that's all I have. Again, if you'd like to hear more, please contact me. Thank you, Brian. Um, we, uh, I want to thank all the panelists for their presentations. And considering we started a little late, we ended right on time. Uh, I hope we, Paul, we can have a moment or two for at least one or two questions. Um, and in, to facilitate the discussion, I'd like to go to the next slide, Paul. Thank you. And this, uh, some of the uh, panelists presented losses. I presented uh, some loss estimates. So this is a comparison. Um, AIR uh, presented losses of, of nine to about $18 billion for the Montreal area for two selected events. CoreLogic, uh, Tom showed that graph, which ranged depending on the magnitude, billions of dollars uh, up to as much as $20 billion. And the um, losses, uh, from the ICLR studies that, that I was the primary author on was shown to range anywhere from around seven up to as high as $28 billion for magnitude seven in the Montreal area. So you can see that um, while there's quite a bit of variation, which everyone has emphasized, there is uh, some uh, consistency also in that the losses are in the billions of dollars, all of it in short, which emphasizes the importance of this problem. Um, now, um, I don't see any, uh, there is one question here, and that is uh, addressed to me. How do you validate estimated losses for Vancouver and Montreal in your recent studies? What kind of events did you use for validation? Um, the, uh, well, there have been no fire following losses in Vancouver or Montreal, uh, but there are, validation has been done against the uh, historic events in, uh, all the 1989, 1994 uh, events in California, in Japan, and so on. So the answer to that question is, um, to the extent possible, we, we validate um, against those events. We also break down about the process of ignitions, and we look at the number of ignitions that have occurred in many earthquakes, so we validate that part of the modeling. And the fire spread can be validated from non-earthquake events. Um, and we look at the fire spread in other large fires, such as the uh, fires we've had in uh, the urbanized parts of the wildland interface fires, such as in Santa Rosa in the Tubbs fire a couple of years ago, um, and, uh, and in high rise building fires. And we look at water damage to water systems in other events also. So that's, I hope that answers that question. Um, I have a question for the panelists, but. I would like to share an anecdote, which is Tom showed that photograph, Tom Larson showed that photograph of the 1989 earthquake. And I, he and I were working uh, at, at EQE International at that time on the, I think it was the 19th floor of a high rise building downtown San Francisco. And Tom sat right outside my office, you know, he was in our group. And when I, when the shaking started, I went to the window to look to see if I could see any dust as signs of collapsing buildings. And I did observe that. I saw a number of dust clouds and collapsing buildings. And then it occurred to me, while the shaking was quite strong, that sitting, standing next to a window in a high rise building during a strong earthquake was probably not a good idea. So I started to move away from the window. And just as I was moving away, the shaking started to subside. And I heard Tom outside the door of my office saying, gee, 15 seconds, not, not bad for an earthquake. And I thought to myself, this kid is timing the earthquake. <laughs> He's got gumption. <laughs> I've never forgotten that. <laughs> and it was, a, it was an interesting day. So um, Tom mentioned tipping point. And the question I would have is, I don't see any other questions right now from other persons. The question I would have for all the panelists is, um, if you think of, to use the most recent terminology, if you think of fires uh, as sort of an epidemic, which is, or a pandemic, which is the mathematics are exactly the same. And if you think of sprinklers as a kind of vaccination, then, the fact that Vancouver's high-rise buildings don't have secondary water supplies uh, means in effect they're not vaccinated. So I would just ask each of the modelers if they thought about that in their modeling and how they might have taken that into account. And I was wondering if anyone might 
um, want to respond to that? Uh, uh, Arash, Brian, or Tom? Well, maybe I can add something. We don't specifically have that sprinkler model uh, at the moment for our Canada model. We do have it for our US earthquake model. This is something that we can definitely think of adding later. Uh, but one thing is that the connection and interaction between the sprinkler damage and, and fire uh, is not explicitly included. So they're basically treated as two separate uh, perils, you know, that water damage because of the sprinkler and fire damage because of fire, obviously. But mm. this is definitely some interesting area that, that uh, requires attention and needs to be included. Thank you, Arish, and thank you for your frankness there. Um, it's uh, always room for improvement, right? And uh, uh, Brian or Tom, you comments? Yeah, so so we definitely, I think, I'm not sure specifically about I mean, uh, sprinklers in in for fire damage or like whether they're there or not, but we do have vulnerability curves you know, based off of each city, right? So Vancouver definitely has its own vulnerability curves that, that, are, um, that are impacted in that way. So it's like an implicit rather than explicit characterization. Um, and again, as Rash said, we also do, uh, it's in terms of sprinklers, there's sprinkler leakage, which is has a hard, huge impacts on contents, content yeah. damage. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Tom, Tom, any comment? Yeah, Charlie, you know, it, it's a good one because we could work out, you know, what's the effective load? What's the, the volume of water needed to run those sprinklers? But, you know, when you start adopting sprinkler mandates, California has done them, it does, um, it cuts both ways because what happens after an earthquake? Sprinkler leakage, and that's another kind of sleeper loss that we've got there. Um, those pipes are heavy, and so and they are an inert. They get inertial loads from the earthquakes, and they get damaged and they break. And so as we start adopting them more and more, as, as we have a, a charged water system that's on the municipal water, and we get breaks. And so that that building that you talked about, Charlie, that had sprinklers. Well, it just took all the water supply so that the fire next door doesn't have any water left to fight. And it, it's a challenge that we all have is how do we design this, knowing what's practically going to happen, um, that we're going to try to fix one thing and then we open up a vulnerability elsewhere. It's a continual, as we try to lower the risk, we're going to have to keep pushing that forward. But it, it's something you have to think about as a model. Well, thank you. Well, I'm um, up here, Charlie, actually. Our, my model developers are actually telling me that we do actually specifically have sprinkler uh, damage in Canada. <laughs> I'm sorry, say that again, please. That we do actually have uh, specific sprinkler models for Canada. Uh, okay, recently, for so. sprinkler leakage. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, so we, let's close the session in interest of time and allow the next session uh, their appropriate amount of time. I would just say, by the way, that however, that Vancouver has had mandated sprinklers for a long time. Not they just don't have secondary water supply. And overall, I think I want to compliment the uh, people of the Lower Mainland for their earthquake preparedness. I think that by and large doing a great job. Um, so with that, thank, I want to thank all the panelists and uh, close the session. Thank you so much. Thanks, Carly. Thanks, everybody. That was uh, incredibly informative on a really important topic. And uh, thank you for uh, all the time you put into planning out the session and all the information you're able to share. So thank you. Sorry we didn't have more time for conversation. Thanks, Charlie, for leading that. <laughs>